Thanks for joining us. Good to see you guys here today. Let us know where you're coming in from. Pop it in the chat. If you look on the bottom part, you'll see the little chat button. You can let us know where you're calling in from. We always love to know. We'll give everyone just a couple minutes to trickle in. We've got Vaughn here helping on the chat. So if you um, have questions throughout, she'll tag them because we'll have some question time at the end. So, oh yeah, Ina, great to see you. You're in Austin. Nice. So, Ina, we're super happy to have you on our upcoming trip. Christina's over here in Northern California for us. All right, so we'll go ahead and get, get chatting. All right, so today we've got myself. Um, Michelle, great to see you from Tennessee. Um, I'm the founder of Traverse Journeys. And we've got Marta calling in from Lisbon. So she is our local Portuguese guide. So oh. we'll be... Uh, talking through our uh, our presentation today. Mark, thanks for calling in from Scottsdale. That's awesome. All right. So just a little introduction if you don't know Traverse Journeys. So we do small group tours, self-guided tours, and quite a number of destinations. Very focused on the experience, like, like people, getting to know people, people-to-people -people interactions, like having meaningful conversations, learning about like different cultures, very important for us. Um, planets, you know, when we're talking about leave no trace if we're camping, plastic weight, waste reduction, and of course, like appreciation for nature and all of it's like everywhere we go, there's like really incredible landscapes, places to get out of like the city. And then, of course, purpose. So travel is really powerful and, and transformative. And so we want that your trips to have meaning, but not just meaning for you, but for the people that we visit as well. So those are all things that are very much infused into our trips, into the design and the flow that we do. So we're going to take you around Portugal today. So this is a group of us with Marta from uh, last year. So Marta, can you tell us a little bit about Portugal, you know, the geography, climate, where it's placed, like the different regions? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for for the, the invite to, to be here today. It's a pleasure. Um, so Portugal, uh, as you might already know, because it is definitely becoming much more popular, it's uh, one of the smallest countries in Europe. In this case, specifically, it's one of the more um, Western countries. Uh, it forms with Spain, the Iber called the Iberian Peninsula. And so we share more or less the same type of climate and um and also a lot of the cultural things uh, as in Spain. And although we are not technically in the Mediterranean itself, because all of the coast of Portugal is in the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, but we definitely have what it's called the Mediterranean climate. And also, for example, what it's called the diet, the Mediterranean diet in terms of the food. So the basis is very, very similar to Southern Europe. Uh, Portugal is divided. Usually we tend to say that it's in three areas. So the Northern part of the country, the central part of the country and the South. Uh, this in the main level, of course, what we can see here in the map, there are also two sets of islands, two archipelagos in the Atlantic, uh, one called the Azores and then also Madeira, which are both still under Portuguese rule. Um, and in Portugal, for example, if you have a chance of looking at a map with a bit more detail, you'll see there's like two main rivers, uh, one called the Douro River, which goes into the ocean in Porto, and then also the Tejo River that goes into the ocean in Lisbon. And those rivers also work as a bit of a border of the country. So making those three different um, regions that I mentioned. The climate is usually a temperate climate. So uh, the northern part of the country does tend to get a little bit colder. Uh, there are even areas where it can snow in the winter time, especially north interior part of the country, but then the center and especially the south definitely tend to be a lot warmer. Um, for example, in the winter time, the furthest south part of the country called the Algarve is actually considered a very nice place to spend the, the winter time. Uh, I usually say that for, I think most of you, if not all, are from the United States, so you probably understand what I'll say, that the Algarve, uh, as well as, for example, southern Spain, uh, is sometimes known a little bit as the Florida. Uh, yes, so, Frankie, when did you say the last uh, payment is due, the final? Second, Sorry, we have that <laughs> one person, do you mind uh, Seven. It is for, did I book the wrong date? It is for this year. Oh, got it. There we go. <laughs> a quick reminder to everyone, if you don't mind putting yourself on mute, that would be great. All right. Continuing on, Marta. Well, no, uh, basically, yeah. So I was ex just explaining, I think, more or less the, the, the shape of the country and how it's, uh, how it's um, let's say, how it functions a little bit in terms of, uh, of the, the structure. 
Uh, in terms of uh, history, as you can see here, uh, as a bit of um, a summing up, but I want only want to focus that the main, uh, let's say, influence that we can still see today, that it's more felt today, it goes back mostly to uh, two main civilizations. So one, of course, the Romans that uh, populated this region of, of Europe for a very, very long time. Uh, and then after the Romans, we had the Moors, as you can see here, uh, especially from the 8th, 9th century. That's when we have uh, the biggest um, influence, um, as well as in Spain, uh, southern Spain and southern Portugal mostly. Uh, but then, of course, things have changed quite a lot. And Portugal was actually formed as an official country still in the 12th century. So it is actually considered one of the oldest countries in Europe and specifically the country that has the oldest borders also in Europe. Um, as it says here, it's still mostly a Catholic country, but like most of the Western world nowadays, uh, I wouldn't really say that we are a very, very religious country. Of course, there's still a lot of culture that is based in religion, um, but still uh, nowadays, and especially since uh, we became a republic and since our democracy, uh, which started in 1976, uh, that we are, don't have an official religion. And so it's a pretty open country in most of the things, uh, quite liberal country, of course, you notice that more in urban areas, the bigger cities, a little bit different in inland part of the country. But I think overall, and if I can just use one word to describe the Portuguese, I would say generous, we are quite generous. And just as an example, that shows, for example, in the usually very generous portions of food that we usually have in our restaurants. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a really good segue into like, we love to talk about values and um, like what makes certain cultures certain ways. And so one of the things that you notice in Portugal is it's what we call a collectivist culture. So people think in terms of we rather than me, there's a very high emphasis on family and relationships. So you might see this play out, for example, with relationships like punctuality or being exactly on time is much less important than having a good conversation over a delicious meal and like letting the time kind of take itself, you know, like groups are really important. Your, your networks are really important. It's also what we call a feminine society, which doesn't mean like masculine feminine. What it means is you work to live rather than live to work. So like it's driven by these relationships, like the better for the society versus like other cultures, what would be more driven by competition, for example, or individualism. So that's um, an example of like kind of some Portuguese values and culture that you might experience there. Marta, do you want to add anything to that? No, I totally agree that uh, for sure. I think here people definitely value a lot the time spent with friends and family. And, and um, definitely punctuality is not something we are very good at, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but it's something we love. So let's take a trip. So this picture is out in wine country. It's so beautiful. So in our itinerary, this is a little overview. You can see kind of the map that we start out, like people come into Port or into Lisbon and we go up north and we make a little bit of a, a loop. So, you know, in this conversation, you can use this information for your own use. If you're designing your own itinerary, this is how we've chosen to flow ours to like make the best use of like, the kind of combination of, you know, things that you want to see, like UNESCO sites, et cetera, but like little hidden gems along the way, because that's like part of like Portugal's charm is these little places that you would just really never know about. Um, Marta, do you want to just like give a quick little overview of this flow that we have? Uh, yeah, we'll sure. Um, in a minute. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, basically, this is a plan that uh, is designed to to cover about a week. And so it starts in Lisbon, which is our main city and the capital of the country, with a focus, of course, in the city itself, also in the region around Lisbon, especially this very lovely uh, town called Sintra, which itself is a World Heritage um, location uh, for a day. Then from Lisbon, we head up to the north to our second main city called Porto, again, with a little time to focus in the city and also a little bit outside. Uh, especially then following the Douro River, the very famous Douro River, so big, big wine region, where uh, it is included to spend a night in the, this region that is really, really lively to, to explore. Uh, after that, I would say it's kind of the part of this uh, tour that it's a bit less touristic in the sense that it covers a part of the country that is probably not as touristic, where people usually tend not to go so much when they don't really have a lot of time going to a town called Tumar, which is a very, very lovely town 
that has a very important monument, also World Heritage sites, but because of the location, sometimes the place people don't really have a chance to go, but it's really worth it. And then back a little bit towards the coast again to visit a couple of uh, other very lovely cities uh, with the, the focus, for example, in Nazare, which is nowadays very famous for surf, for example, and then back to Lisbon for a very nice farewell, farewell of the country. Yeah, exactly. And so to dive a little bit deeper into these, so like Lisbon itself, like has a lot of soul, like there's all this amazing street art, which we go into more deeply and learn. It's a great way to learn history and to learn about like the cultural revolution and all of these things that make Lisbon what it is today. And we also look at um, Fado, the Fado music experience and that history. Like Sintra has all this architecture and like older history. And it has like all these amazing stories of like the royalty that would go out to Sintra, you know, to escape the city. Uh, and then of course, Port is famous for Port, like Porto is famous for Port, like the wine and like how that's made and why it was made. And as Marta said, like going inland to wine country, it's a nice reprieve from the city. You're out in this like beautiful vistas in Tamar. Um, there's history behind the Knights of Templar, which maybe you've heard of before. And then like all throughout like that coastal ride home, dining in the Portuguese way, like fresh outside, like it's amazing. So let's dive in a little bit more into like what makes Lisbon special. I'm going to note a few things here and then Marta, you can give us your insider uh, insiders. So as you know, someone visiting, one thing that I love to show people, as I was just mentioning, is the street art. So there's so much history in the street art. Sometimes people come to Lisbon and they're like, why is there graffiti? If you start looking into it, these still tell incredible stories. And there's like certain neighborhoods where a lot of this artwork is, is focused. And so we take you through that area. Marta, is there anything you want to add on like the street art piece of Lisbon? In the street art, of course, nowadays it's it's a obviously big trend to have a lot of street art uh, showcased, especially in uh, urban areas. But in Portugal and in Lisbon specifically, this started first because of the fact that Lisbon, until some years ago, before this tourism boom, was actually very run down. So there were many areas of the city where a lot of buildings were abandoned, and that kind of became an easy way for a lot of artists, especially you no know, artists that were still not not known, to be able to show their art. And then there was a change in the politicians' view that they really noticed that it could be something interesting. And so they literally legalized the situation of people being able to paint and do other types of arts. Uh, but also because it usually would start in periods of some turmoil, you know, political things, maybe during, for example, our last financial crisis about 12 years ago that prompted a lot of protests. And many times the street art in Portugal specifically initially and originally was very connected to this type of uh, protests, for example. So that was always very important. And even today, we can still see some of some of that art that is still connected to things that people are fighting for, for example. Exactly. Um, and actually, in the Grasa neighborhood, to segue over to the Fado, there's an area of where that music form was really like had a lot of roots. And so there's a lot of art and old photography that goes into the Fado music, which we take you out to. And it's a really intimate experience because it's in these small little bars, you know, not the tourist one that's like put on as a show, but we're talking like the little tiny bars that have like the the one woman singing, the couple of people on the guitar. And it's a really intimate experience. And when you hear the music, it has this like melancholic sound. It really goes back to like the seafarers when they are out to sea. It's a really, really lovely. And it's something that pairs well with like kind of like getting your getting your sea legs, so to speak, in Portugal. Marta, do you want to add on to Fado? Yeah, I would like to say as a curiosity because it's something that a lot of times people don't know that this word Fado, and even when people have heard about Fado before, and they might have even heard about some songs and know something about it, but the word Fado in Portuguese, uh, aside of the, the, the type of music, it also means fate, something like destiny, but definitely in a more nostalgic and kind of heavy type of connotation. So, and definitely Fado has that. Many times people tend to compare or say that Fado for us works a bit like the blues work for, you know, uh, the, the, the U.S., but although being totally different types of uh, music, but definitely it's a very, very special experience that even if, you know, most of the times people probably won't understand the lyrics because they're, they're in Portuguese, 
but usually it's a really, really nice experience to have. And I do agree that it's a good thing to do, for example, uh, the start of a visit because it kind of sets the tone for understanding better Portuguese culture. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and so some other things in Lisbon that you might experience, there's a really great food scene. We do, we offer um, like a day tour, food tour that like chef run and it's like all of the little restaurants like maybe you wouldn't have heard of and like the stories behind them because there are a lot of cultural influences on the food. We'll talk about food a little bit more. And then of course, like the iconic architecture, like there's a lot of Moorish influence. There's a great Sunday farmer's market uh, at LX Factory if you happen to be there. I actually have a necklace on today that I got there last time I was there. So lots of special things to do. That's just a little preview of what you can see with the photo. So here's some of the artwork that we were talking about. Like there's a number of like internationally renowned artists as well. When we do our artwork talk, you also like get to learn about like graffiti and youth and why it's used in that way as well. The one on the left is... um leave in the Grasa neighborhood. Um, and then in terms of like where we stay in accommodations, so the one on the left here is in Lisbon, the one on the right here is wineries. So we really as a company like to focus on like boutiques, small hotels. Portugal kind of has its own system to hotels. A lot of them are not, I mean, you do of course have big chain hotels, whatnot, but a lot of the hotels that you'll find will be ones that are family run, Maybe they only have four rooms or six rooms. Um, they can be more like apartment style. So they really are welcoming. They really make you feel like at home as a guest versus just staying at a, a hotel that isn't that interesting. So moving on from Lisbon, we go into Sintra and it is touristy, absolutely, but it is also a must see. So Marta, do you wanna take this one and talk a little bit about this experience? Yes, of course. Um, Sintra definitely is one of the more touristic places in Portugal, no doubt about that. Uh, but I still think it's definitely a place that everyone should visit when they are in Lisbon. Of course, ideally, and that's also one of the, the ideas of this tour, and that's why it's, uh, it, it happens usually a bit in the shoulder season, is that there is a way to see it, which is uh, obviously visit outside of the busy season, but also try to do, for example, um, the earliest possible. So getting to Sintra, for example, a bit earlier, which is something that we are obviously considering. Um, but also sometimes uh, choosing the right place to visit, you know, because there are many, many monuments in Sintra. In a very, very short amount of space, there's actually a, a really a lot to do. So I would even say that for someone that is planning a trip on their own, or if they're considering spending more time in Portugal and specifically in the Lisbon area, I would even say that Sintra probably would deserve a full day, if not even two or three days. Um, uh, but definitely it's a place that deserves a visit. It's really, really beautiful, very green. It's actually inside of a natural park called Sintra Cascais Natural Park. So there is definitely a lot to do and uh, we just try to do it as best as possible to avoid the main crowds and to have a good experience. Yeah, exactly. And you can see some of the pictures of the architecture. It's like, it really is incredible. So after for us and our the flow that we take, so we go from Lisbon on to Porto, um, but we'd make a little stop on the way at this really chill, beautiful little town called Aveiro. There are these little canals that are like alike into Venice. Um, Marta, can you tell us why you picked Aveiro? Well, in this case, the idea was that due to time constraints, of course, we could only choose one place and, and considering the rest of the, the tour that we have planned, on the way up, it would make sense. First, because Aveiro is already in this region that we call like center north part of the country. So it's a little bit of a preview of what it's possible to find in this more northern part of the country, not just in terms of culture, but also in terms of weather, for example. Uh, but Aveiro specifically, because as you pointed out, it's true, a lot of times people refer to it as the Venice of Portugal. I don't know if uh, we, the people are joining us today, if anyone has been to Venice, I can tell you that it's really nothing like Venice. <laughs> It's mostly because of the canals, which are quite nice, and they were built because of uh, one of the main trades that they used to have in Aveiro, uh, which is, for example, they have some salt production still there going on, but they also had a few other things connected to the ocean, um, and also the river in Aveiro, which is a very big estuary. So they still have a lot of that, and the canals were built you know, for people to be able to, to transport all of these things you know, from the ocean part to inside of the city. But it's just a really nice place. It's not a very big city. It's usually um, quite nice. And, you know, in a short stop, it's possible to really see. And we've, 
like it is in other places, you know, it also has quite a few things that are um, typical, such as, for example, some pastries. And so that's definitely will be on our plan because we're never that far from sweets here in Portugal. So Alvaro is no exception. Yeah, absolutely. And so moving on, when we get into Port Porto, another option for like a food tour. And when we talk about these food tours, we're talking like four or five hours in depth and everything's really spaced out well. So like you're trying little tidbits of things, but you're not just trying the food, you're getting the stories, like why something was made and how and what's the history behind it and who's making it, who's keeping the traditions alive. I love those um, types of really in-depth tours. We also talk about like the history in the city and get some tastings like port, how it's made, why it was made. We haven't talked about the pastéis de nata, but this is one of the famous uh, pastries of Portugal. So we'll tell you the history about um, how those were made and why they were made. Um, and then the architecture in, in, in Porto is really stunning. Marta, do you want to add anything else about Porto? Uh, yes, Porto is, is, sorry. Porto, is quite, no, Porto is is different from Lisbon, for sure. It has a, has a different vibe, uh, not just because it's smaller and so it does feel a bit more cozy. A lot of people, for example, consider Porto to be a very romantic city, for example. But also because of the weather, Porto tends to be not as hot as Lisbon. In the winter, definitely can get a little bit colder and it'll, it'll be rainier. But it's a beautiful place. You know, actually, uh, um, so a part of, the, of the, the sites of Porto are actually also a world heritage. Uh, and of course, the wine is pretty much everywhere. So that's definitely one of the, the highlights of the city and the region. Uh, but food, like everywhere in Portugal, is very important. And I think the main difference in, in, in Porto, as an example, but uh, showcasing the north overall, is that it's, I think, a part of the country that is still more connected to the roots of what is Portuguese culture, while, for example, Lisbon and the south tend to be a little bit more multicultural. And so in that sense, uh, not as, uh, let's say, um, traditional in that sense. So Porto still has a bit of that feeling that I think it's it's quite nice and it's different and interesting to see those contrasts, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And this little video here, um, back here, uh, it was of the, the fish market and then this <laughs> tasting. So wine tasting is always a fun thing to do. And then this is specifically port. And it's really fascinating, the history of how it's made, why it was made, how it's connected to sailing. Um, so something definitely to try and understand. So this, I'm going to show you a little video here. This is an, a hike that we offer that's optional. And so another thing I had mentioned, like when we put tours together, we're also thinking about nature excursions. And sometimes for trips like this particular one is we've made it optional. So you don't have to do it. You could spend the day in Porto exploring on your own, or you can go on this like hike. And there's a bridge, which I'll have Marta tell us about. I'll just play you this little video. So just a little short clip of that. Marta, can you tell us about this hike and the bridge and why it's famous? Well, Ashley, I have to tell you one thing, and this might sound strange, but I personally haven't crossed that bridge, so you could probably talk about that better than me because I've never <laughs> done it. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, in any case, this is just an example, and in this case, I would say one of the best examples of a big trend that we have in Portugal now for a few years, which in Portuguese is where you can see written here, Pasadizos, I would translate this into a type of wooden walkways that we have in many, many parts of the country. You know, some of them are along the coast, others are more inland, in mountain areas. In this case, this, this walkway is following a river called the Paiva River, which is just a little bit south of Porto, a bit more inland, but uh, not too far away from uh, Porto. Uh, it was one of the first that opened and it was so, so popular that still today a lot of people visit because it's almost, it's not free technically, but it's almost free. And so people really, really liked it. It's very popular. And then more recently, they decided to build this bridge because in some parts of that area, um, it's almost like a canyon. So it can be actually quite deep all the way down into the river. And so as a little added bonus and another attraction, which even has a separate ticket, for example, so it's optional, uh, they decided to build this suspension bridge. It's only a walking bridge, a suspension bridge, uh, which has, I think, roughly about 500 meters. I'm sorry, I, I'm not good in conversion, but has about 500 meters long. And I think until very recently was considered actually the longest um, walking suspension bridge in the world. So for people that like, you know, adrenaline and are not afraid of heights, definitely it's a highlight. If you do decide to take this, uh, this extra activity, for sure, it will be worth it. Yeah. And as you can see what, the, what it looks like, 
it's a really incredible hike. Like the, it's really cool to go across that bridge and learn about the engineering behind it. And then the hike itself along those wooden walkways, as Marta was saying, is absolutely gorgeous. And the hike so, itself, I think in miles might be about three miles, 3.5 yeah, miles. Not, not super long. It's a pretty short yeah, hike. Very long. But it's a really nice chance to get out and get some nature because you really are just away from cars. You're away from the city. So it's it really is beautiful. So this uh, moving on is at our winery that we visit uh, in the Douro Valley. So a little bit of history about the Douro Valley. Um, it was the first region to be regulated with its own legislation. We love to go experience it at a winery because like a small family run one. So you can see the vineyards, you can go for walks, you can see the sunset, it's a really nice reprieve. And then hear from you know the winery owners, you know their take on their wines. Uh, Marta, what do you want to add on to the wine country? Uh, well, wine country, to be honest, it's almost everywhere in Portugal, but specifically here in the Douro Valley, I'd say it's probably the more popular region. And this is obviously due to the fame of uh, port wine, which is not the only type of wine that is made there because in the Douro Valley, as well as in the rest of the country, we pretty much produce every type of wine. But the port wine is specific from the Douro region. So just to give you a bit of a better idea, it's the same thing as champagne. If you think about champagne that is from a specific region in France, and that's, uh, let's say, a trademark, port wine is the same. So port wine can only be called port wine if it's produced in the Douro Valley. Um, and as uh, Ashley mentioned, the Douro Valley is the oldest recognized wine region in the world since 1756, uh, which is really, really impressive. And, uh, you know, just as a little bit of pre preview, is very connected to the history of English families that at the point settled in that region to, to explore the production of wine and especially then exporting the wine to England and then to other parts. So still today, there's still a big influence from, uh, from these uh, especially English families. But in this case, uh, it's a small run um, family winery in, uh, in not a very deep part of the Douro Valley because the Douro Valley, like many other parts of the country, of course, it would require a lot more days to be able to explore in depth. And that would be totally worth it if you can definitely have those days. But it, it will be already a very, very good way to have an idea about what the Douro Valley is, even as a landscape, because again, it's also a world heritage uh, landscape, um, but also to have a bit uh, of an idea of not only trying the wines, but understand a bit of, of how people live there, because it's a, it's a very interesting part and very beautiful part of the country. Yeah, exactly. So you can see like this is one of the sunsets from a little hike uh, at, at the winery. So very, very beautiful place to stay. So when we leave the Douro Valley and head back south, we take a really interesting route that takes you through some of like medieval Portugal. So we stop at one of the this cathedral right here. Um, I've got a little video, and then Marta, you can tell us a little bit about it. Yes, Lamego is still, so Lamego, which is the name of the town where this uh, cathedral is located, this is just literally south, uh, it's only about a 20 minute drive from the winery where we're going to stay, so it's still technically in the Douro uh, Valley region, but it's a very good example of how important this religious history and this connotation with the religion uh, in Portugal, because uh, obviously we have quite a few churches, uh, a lot of old monasteries, convents, etc. And this one in the Douro uh, Valley region is one of the more popular ones, especially because it has a very, very long staircase that obviously the, 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 the ones that are a bit more fit, they can do it for sure, because it's very, very worth it. And um, I can tell you, for example, just as a curiosity, because of the time of the year that we are now, end of August, uh, I can tell that right now it's already the harvesting time. And for example, the city of Lamego is one of the places where they usually have these harvest festivals, in this case, specifically focused on wine. And so it's just overall a really beautiful region and it allows us to really know a bit more of the country, especially inland part of Portugal, uh, by going uh, towards the Tumar, which is really in the center of the country. If you look at the map, you can see it's really uh, exploring the center of the country with Lamego being a, a, a short stop on the way. Exactly. And then when we get into Tomar, we do a specific walking tour there with a local guide who can tell tell you all of the history, like very specific to that area, because the Knights of Templar, that was one of their strongholds. The Moors were also there. There's a Gothic church and then a Convent of Christ, which I believe is also a UNESCO site. Yeah, so it's a very see. central, like historic little town. Um, and Martin knows the best spot for sunset there. 
Um, so you can see some pictures, like it's just very peaceful, very easy to walk around, not like super touristy. I mean, it has the infrastructure in terms of like its history, but it's just a nice little reprieve and a great way to learn about like medieval Portugal. So after Tamar, we start heading back down to Lisbon, but we take this nice little coastal route. Um, Marta, do you want to talk, talk about the coastal route? Yes, of course. So basically from Tamar, we'll head straight towards the ocean. And that will happen in this town called Nazaré, which is for a very long time one of the favorite beach destinations for people in the central part of Portugal. Like many other uh, coastal cities, in this case, is also a very big fishing port. So usually it's also a place where a lot of people like to go, you know, to have a nice seafood lunch, uh, basically just to explore the coast because, you know, being lucky with the weather, you have great, great views. Because in Nazaré, there is, for example, a cliff that just overlooks the town. But in the last few years, it became a really, really popular place because of surf, because you might have heard or even seen uh, uh, on television, for example, that Nazaré became famous for waves that can get to 80 feet. So that's actually something that, of course, does not happen every day. And in this time of the year that we're doing this tour, probably won't happen because it's mostly something that happens in the winter time. But it is a very, very beautiful place. And then basically following the coast a bit further down, we will uh, stop by another town, in this case, is a medieval walled town called Obidus, um, that is also a little bit touristic, I'm not going to lie, but also very worth to visit. Um, and then we will just continue going back to Lisbon so that the people can enjoy their last night. Yeah. And we have some, like, we take you to, there's so many great spots, it's hard to even choose, but like saying for farewell in Lisbon, there's a really great kind of more locally frequented area of the city that's like we take a ferry to get to and that's where we love to take you for our farewell and some of the seafood is just absolutely amazing so kind of segueing over to like food in Portugal um it's of course like a very seafood based country when it comes to food uh Marta do you want to tell us about like kind of top Portuguese food and then I'm going to talk a little bit about dietary restrictions and all the things like that you might want to know about when traveling to Portugal Yes, uh, Portuguese food, I would start to say that it's uh, uh, it's the variety. So uh, as Ashley said, for sure, we have a big base on seafood, uh, but also meat because Portugal is a small country and it has a very large coast, of course, but the more inland parts of the country due to the fact that they don't have an easy access to fresh fish. So they do tend to focus more on meat. But at the same time, it's a country, for example, where we eat a lot of rice. This might sound a bit strange, but... Definitely, it's a big, big staple in Portugal, so much that we actually have rice fields in the country, for example. Um, but a lot of the food is also connected and the influences of the food uh, come from places such as Northern Africa because of this uh, influence we had from the Moors and even the proximity to Northern Africa. But even Asia, you know, the Orient, due to the Portuguese history of navigation and exploring the world. Um, so that might explain, for example, um, what we have, you know, this big thing about the rice. But I would say just to kind of mention one thing, because, and, and Ashley did mention previously the, the fact about one of the sweets, the more known sweets, which is a pastel de nata, that it's called, uh, which is usually uh, mentioned as a custard tart. So that's a big, big staple. You see that you can find that pretty much in every corner. But when it comes to savory, I would say that the main thing you're going to find is codfish, we call bacalhau. And codfish is something that also very interestingly, we do not have in our water. So just for you to know, is 100% imported, but it's still one of the most popular types of food that we have in the country. And so I'm sure that when you are able to visit us, you will be able to, to try many different ways of cooking codfish. But just to say that overall, Portugal is a great country to eat. It's still very possible and easy to find some very local, small spots, many times family run uh, pretty much all throughout the country. And to give you an idea, I would say that it's very common and easy to be able to have a full meal, even including wine, for example, for sometimes around 20 euros a person. So that's still something that is possible in Portugal, for example. Yeah, exactly. And what you'll find when you're eating, like there's like soups and stews, there's lots of different kinds, there's seafood of all kinds. Portugal has really like famous cured meats, you know, especially the, the ham, the cured ham really incredible cheeses that are quite local, whether they're like a cow's cheese or a goat's cheese, you know, that Mediterranean climate with like olives, even though it's not technically Mediterranean, but that type of food with olives and citrus and like all the vegetables that are in season, coffee and pastries, of course, 
as Martha had mentioned, like the global influence, you know, also quality. I mean, Portugal really prides itself on like, you know, a specific cheese from a specific region and it being like a really high quality, you know, like they're the cows are eating grass, you know, they're not just being fed soy crop or something like that. So something that's very, um, you know, pride is like these maybe simple, humble ingredients, but very high quality ingredients. So as far as like dietary restrictions um, go, Vegan and vegetarian can absolutely be done. It's a little challenging. I think it's, it, I think in the cities, it's much easier in the countryside, maybe a little bit more challenging, but it is absolutely doable. There's lentils, like different kinds of lentils and beans for your protein. If you're pescatarian, quite easy. There's fish and seafood everywhere. And then for gluten-free, like as Marta said, there's rice, not a problem. And potatoes are like great carb sources. So it's a little overview of the food for you. Um, you can see some pictures of like charcuterie type boards, you know, like really good, you know, things to snack on, some really beautiful locations. One thing that I'll say for food is in terms of like food culture, it, everything takes longer. So there's not really the idea of like sitting down and eating lunch in 30 minutes. Like if that's the expectation, it's not likely to happen. So a lot of times, like if you order a super stew, for example, like they're kind of like making it from scratch to some degree. So it might take a while. So, and also, as we talked about earlier, you know, culturally, there's that focus on relationships and like time isn't really like the highest priority. So it's not expected for you to just like eat and run, right? You're like sitting down and enjoying the meal and letting it digest and having good conversations. So a little trick for you, if you, you know, are planning to have lunch, give yourself lots of time. If I can add just uh, something, just as a curiosity, yeah. here in Portugal, you have to wait even to pay. <laughs> yeah, this is also true. So if you are in like, you know, better not to be in a rush, put it that way. Just like a good idea to not plan to be rushing, you know, things will take a while. And it's something too, that I like to talk to you about, um, you know, with, with our American clients and I'm American uh, and you know, just like this idea of they're not trying to churn people in and out of the restaurant, right? Like you're there for however long you want and need to be there. So you might have to catch their attention, a, a waiter's attention a lot more if you want something more to drink or if you want, you know, the check kind of thing. But, you know, it's not a sign of bad service whatsoever. It's actually a sign of good service because they're letting you, letting you be and letting you enjoy. So something to, to um, think about there. Roger, I see your question. We'll have some question time um, at the end as well. But on the note, uh, Marta, do you, what, how would you say the Portuguese siesta is handled? Uh, well, first of all, I would say it's not such a common thing here as it is probably still in parts of Spain, especially southern Spain. But definitely in, I would say, the southeastern part of the country, where it does get quite hot in the, in the summertime, um, it, I would say it's probably common for people to kind of have a little bit of a break in the afternoon. If they do go to nap or not, it's a bit difficult to say for sure. But I would say it's it's common, but only maybe in that part of the country. So it's not like a nationwide thing and still probably not as big as it is in Spain. Yeah, great question. So just some quick travel tips for you and then we'll be getting to questions. So we love to promote spring and fall at like their shoulder seasons. There's not as many tourists. It's not as like hot. Um, you know, it also helps out our partners a lot because like we work in the, the realm of sustainable tourism in which we're trying to create, you know, opportunities for our, our operating partners like on the ground. And so if it's a little slow for them, like in the early spring or the late fall, it's really great if we can have trips that send people there at that time. So we're supporting these small hotels and the wineries and our local guides. And also for you, it's a great time to be traveling because there's not like lots and lots of tourists and things are like less, less busy. And, you know, for clothing, um, being in Europe, continental Europe, you know, layers are always your friend. Uh, there's like, I mean, generally speaking, the four seasons we will include it on the follow up. But we have we just wrote a blog that's like how to pack for a trip for Europe. So that's a good one to take a look at. And then, as I mentioned before, some little travel tips like timing your meal. So like lunch is usually done being served. I don't know. What do you say, Marta, like 2.30 ish? 233? Um, no, a bit before. I would say probably the, the in average, probably something between 1, 2 p.m. would be probably the more common time for lunch. And then something between 8 to 9 p.m. would be the most common time for dinner in average. Yeah. 
So that's another little tip I like to give people traveling in Portugal is just to be aware because if you're like hungry for lunch at 3 p.m., you're probably not going to find like a great sit down opportunity, maybe if you're in Lisbon, but you can find lots of little snacks and stuff. But um, as far as like for sit down meals, kind of operating within those lunch and dinner times. And then for cultural etiquette, you know, of course, like uh, Portuguese are very friendly, you know, like learn a few words, you know, say hello and your pleases and thank yous. Marta, are there any other pieces of cultural etiquette that you want to pass on? The best advice I can give anyone is uh, if you want to say thank you to someone and you happen not to know how to say it in Portuguese, every, anything you say, don't just don't say gracias and you'll make friends in Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no joke. they're separate. Separate languages, not Spanish. No, nah, no, it's, it's just, a, just a little joke. It's just that, uh, you know, sometimes people do tend to sometimes mixing up a little bit, thinking that maybe Portuguese, Spanish is the same. And although they are similar, no doubt about that, uh, but there are different languages. And the Portuguese people are very proud of the fact that, you know, we are one of the oldest countries in Europe and we have our own language, our own culture. And so not, you know, being annoyed, of course, if something like that happens, even because, as you mentioned, people, especially in main cities, you know, it would be probably quite easy for you to find people speaking English and people are usually quite willing to be able to speak English, you know, to, to help and to make conversation flow a bit better. Uh, so don't, don't really be afraid to speak English with someone if you're really struggling. But I would agree. I think that always learning a few words, you know, the basic words will, will definitely um, take you further. And you'll notice that people usually will reply with, you know, a smile on their faces and things will even be smoother for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And a little fun fact. So thank you in Portuguese is obrigado if you're male and obrigada with an A at the end if you're female. So it's kind of like a little interesting twist on a thank you. I don't see, think I've seen that in another language. So something to, to learn before you go so you can be your first Portuguese word. Yes, that's true. All right. And then just a little side note, you know, as far as like our trips go, if you're interested in like good pairings with a Portugal trip, like if you have time, you know, if you're interested in di diving more deeply into some of these roots of Portuguese architecture and history, going to Morocco is a really good pair with this trip. So we've done it many times for clients. In fact, you know, one of our clients on the call today is going to be doing these in combination. So it's a really cool way to kind of like learn some of the connections between the Moorish influence and the Iberian connection or uh, Iberian Peninsula and Morocco and like all of the history that dates back from that kind of period from like the 7th century to the 12th to 14th century and you'll see a lot of similarities in architecture so really fabulous pairing so just a few things for you and then we'll open up for questions so we do have a trip coming up. It's coming up very soon. So we don't have a lot more time to like plan and book things. But if you do want to join us, we'll give you a little special last minute discount. We also have a self-guided or custom itinerary. So you can check that out. We would love to plan that for you. And we have more events coming up, actually quite a lot. So we're going to be looking at our Greece sailing. We've got a Mexico retreat coming up, New Zealand later in the fall. Um, we've got a few different active retreats like Machu Picchu, and then we've got a really fun one in southern, southwestern France. So be on the lookout either in Meetup or Eventbrite, and we'll also send email links if you want to sign up for any of those. And on to questions. Anyone have any questions? You can type them into the chat. Usually we get lots of questions. Marta, what are some questions people ask you? Um, many times uh, they ask, for example, of in terms of timing. So, for example, duration of stays in a few places, like how many days are usually worth to stay in Lisbon or in Porto, or you know, if for example the region of the Algarve because it's mostly known for the beach, if it's worth to visit outside of the beach season. Um, uh, also, sometimes in terms of the language of uh, this etiquette of you know how to address people um, and. In our case specifically, because we're a small company, also many times people ask about things, you know, like what to avoid in terms of uh, the more touristic sites, or at least what is the best way of visiting a certain site if you really want to go. Um, yeah, that's some of the, the questions that sometimes people ask. Yeah, awesome. Um, okay, I'm going to go through some of these questions. So Dr. Shirley Jackson, thanks for joining us. Um, shoulder season. So typically we are talking about spring and fall. So like March, April, May. September, October, 
you know, it can also be during the winter months. I mean, it's colder, but you can, of course, um, I mean, it's that's like the off season, but it's entirely doable as well. Um, our typical groups, um, like our, our typical is six to 12, but sometimes we have smaller groups. Sometimes we'll have just a couple or four or six. So those vary depending on the trip. And um, I, as far as like a travel advisor, so we don't, we don't, we're not a part of IATA, but we do work with travel advisors. So Aparna, you're absolutely welcome to, you'll get an email from us. You're welcome to email and we can, we'd love to let you know about our travel advisor program. So not a problem. And then Cape Verde, what can you say about that? Uh, I'm not sure exactly which, if it's a specific question, if there's something specific you'd like to know about Cape Verde. So, uh, yeah, well, Cape Verde is not Portuguese. Is it Portuguese? So Cape Verde is a former Portuguese colony. So Cape Verde is a country is a set of islands it's an archipelago uh, in Western Africa. Um, and it was a Portuguese colony for a very long time. So basically since the 15, mid 15th century, all the way until the mid 70s, 1970s, if I'm not mistaken, became independent either in 75, 76. So since then it's, it's an independent country. But of course, due to the history, uh, their official language is Portuguese, although a lot of people in Cape Verde call, uh, speak what we call the Portuguese Creole. So that's very, very common. And we do have a lot of people that are originally from Cape Verde living in Portugal. So people that moved, especially after they became independent, uh, they, a lot of people moved to Portugal, so especially during the 80s. And so nowadays it's one of the um, uh, main foreign communities in the country, although they are usually very well adapted to the country. Uh, so there is definitely a very big connection, but they are not officially Portuguese. They're an independent country. And that's actually something like talking about like the diaspora and different um, like historic groups that are connected to Portugal. If you join us on the street tour and then also on the food tour, we talk a lot about these like communities and how they're a part of, you know, like what their history was, like where their voice is. So that's something that you would absolutely learn on or learn about if you join with us or just if you visit in general. Um, Mark, you asked about time to go off on your own for a few hours. Absolutely. So we design our trips so that you have free time pretty much every day. You know, we like to like focus on the things that are really like unique together and then like let you explore as well. So there's absolutely flexibility there. So any other, any other questions? All right. I think we've covered it then. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great start to your week. It's Monday. Um, thank you, Marta, for all of your information. Uh, as you guys might have heard, Marta is like a wealth of information. So anything you want to learn about Portugal, she's got you covered. Sure, for sure. All thank right, you. thanks so much. Oh, I see one more question, Lupe. How many do you have for? Um, why don't you, um, we're going to send up an email, uh, afterwards. So if you have any more questions, I'll go ahead and just respond directly to you guys. So thank you so much for joining us today and have a thank wonderful day. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.